Um, so, my, my keynote today then, talking about InfoSec and posing the question really whether we've got lots of safeguards, but perhaps even as a consequence of that, not a lot of protection. Perhaps not no protection, but perhaps still not as much as we could actually benefit from as end users and as organisations. So in terms of the, the main content of the talk, I'll give a brief introduction to set the scene. And then I'll talk about, well, first aspect will be the overhead that security can pose for us. So in terms of our use of it as end users, it actually does tend to require an increasing amount, and that, that can add up, and I'll give an illustration of how that can occur. I'll also talk about the increasing footprint that security has within the tools and applications that we find ourselves using on desktop devices, on mobile devices, on online services. It's basically everywhere, and it's requiring more of us. And then from that, looking, okay, are we, in a sense, being deceived by the technology? Are we having a false sense of security because we see so much of it around? Is it giving us this feeling that we ought to be protected because we see so much of it? But in reality, when we come to try and use it, is it actually then showing itself to be, well, perhaps something we don't get on with quite so easily? <laughs> And then flagging towards the need for something to change. In fact, there's, a, there's several some things that I would suggest need to be changed somewhere along the lines here in terms of the technology itself and also our attitudes and organisations' attitudes towards how security gets provided. And then finally, hopefully on time for some coffee, some conclusions. So I think it's fair to say that uh, when you look around and you look at the systems we utilise, it is getting increasingly difficult to, if you wanted to do so, and of course you wouldn't want to escape security because we all love it, uh, but it would be difficult to escape it if we tried to do so. So you've got the, the safeguards in the operating system, in applications, in whatever types of device you're using. There's typically something you can find, sometimes actually not as much as you might want or expect, but there is something there. And if we think about the average user, so perhaps not sort of representative people in this room who are looking at security as part of their careers or their studies or whatever, but the average user is faced with quite a range of things that they're expected to get on with, that they're expected to understand to some degree. And they can, as a consequence of that, find themselves, if they try to do it properly, spending a significant amount of time doing things in support of security and in relation to the safeguards that they're trying to use. But they still, as a consequence of this, they're still facing the risk of attacks. They're not 100% safeguarded. It doesn't make the attacks go away. Um, and as a consequence, they could find themselves thinking, well, okay, we've devoted all this time to it, but yet still, there are problems that we face. Still, we find ourselves exposed. Is it actually worth the effort that we've put into it? Can we manage perhaps with less security? So there's actually a risk there that if they feel they've over-invested time and are still exposed, they might not even use the safeguards that they've used up to that point. And so it's worth considering that one aspect of this is the burden that, that security can represent. So in many cases, it's not the most convenient thing that you find yourself using on systems. In many cases, it is an active barrier between what you're trying to use a device for and the fact that, okay, you've got to get past the security in order to be able to do that. And I say, there needs to be some sort of acceptance of this on the part of users. There needs to be that culture of using security for it to remain something in their minds that they're willing to go with. So, from the user perspective then, the first potential challenge is to actually understand, well, what protection is there? Why is it there? Why, why should I be devoting time to it? And as it says there on the slide, there's a potentially confusing array of technology. Now, I would hope that the things I've listed on the slide are not particularly confusing to the audience here. But if, again, if you think of the average end user and their implicit acquaintance with, well, what's antivirus as distinct from anti-spyware, uh, anti anti-spam, personal files, very often all this is nicely grouped together in a conveniently labeled package called internet security. But still, you've got these aspects that need maintaining, configuring sometimes within that, and there needs to be some level of recognition that these are 
basically performing an important role. And what role are they doing? What's the, what's the impact of having one of them not up to date, not switched on, etc.? And they need to understand also how the tools that they've got available to them relate to the threats that they face. So in some cases, okay, antivirus, that protects you against the threat of virus or more widely malware, so the worms, the trojans, etc. But some of the things, like uh, a firewall, well, unless you actually know more in more detail the role of a firewall, it is actually quite difficult for a user, perhaps, to understand what threats is that actually combating. Okay, protect you against unauthorized traffic. Well, what might that be? Unauthorized, unwanted traffic. Could they make false assumptions there about the level of protection they might get from other threats as a consequence? And they also need to understand how to actually use the protection. And that can be quite a challenge in itself as well, as we should go on to see. And I say, you get this growing footprint, this growing creep of security through the different things that we're required to use. And I, again, wouldn't argue about the necessity of it being there, but the reality is the more it's there, the more it is actually expecting to be done. So just as a few illustrations, I mean, we'll recognize security's there in the operating system. You wouldn't expect to have an operating system without it, to be fair. And a lot of that is stuff that the user is presented with. There are options that the user can at least see, in many cases, ought to have an active role in configuring. Got it in web browsers, email clients, other applications, so you office type of applications, there are plenty of security related features to be found there. And of course, dedicated tools like the internet security, antivirus, etc., that people will choose to have, or in many cases now find themselves provided with as a consequence of buying a system. Okay? And they're going to be there, and in many cases, whether the user goes looking for it or not, they are going to end up having some sort of security-related encounter. And at that point, it's going to take their time, and in some cases, it's also going to present them with something that perhaps is less straightforward to understand than they would hope. So just, it's not going to be particularly readable on the screen from a distance, I guess, but uh, just some illustrative examples from Windows 8, the latest version of Windows, of the list of security-related things that you can find there in the operating system. So I'll just read down the list. You've got the network firewall, you've got Windows Update, virus protection through Windows Defender, spyware protection through Windows Defender, your internet security settings, user account control, yay, yeah, hey. um, smart screen, you've got network access protection, and you've got Windows Activation as well. Now, all of those things, okay, most of them they're all saying on or okay, so everything's fine there. But if something is disabled, if something needs updating, if something is reporting an error, what's the user to understand of that? That's a fairly, you know, straight off the bat, that's a fairly significant list of things that to understand the protection that their operating system is providing them with, that's a fairly steep learning curve for some people straight out there. And then you've got other examples there, the specific interfaces from, say, smart screen within the browser and user account control for the degree of privilege that you give the applications to run without requiring your explicit permission to do things. And again, if these are set wrong, then it can cause inconvenience for the user, and if they're set wrong the other way, it can cause the user to be exposed too greatly to potential problems. And then, of course, there's more things, there's other examples. So this is just the operating system level stuff. This isn't going into any of the other applications um, or the tools that they might have specifically installed. This is just what Windows 8 provides. So the firewall and Windows Defender there for your malware protection. So I say, quite a, quite a comprehensive or significant, at least, set of security things just there at the OS level. So that raises the question, OK, what's this actually meaning in terms of the amount of time that people are spending doing this security-related stuff? Um, so it's, it's not there at no price at all. I mean, you might not have had to pay for it to be there on the system, but it's going to, it's going to cost you something in terms of your interactions. So many people will think that, well, OK, I'm, I'm doing enough just getting on with the work. So you've got this as a potential overhead. So that's just based on my utilization of systems. I've added up, roughly speaking, how long I spend doing particular, what I would class as security-related things, over the course of a day, and then over the course of a week. And let's see how it adds up. So there are various routine security tasks. That, you know, you using passwords on your devices, pins on mobile handsets, passwords on websites, etc. 
guess everybody has the, the issue of you've got your junk mail or spam folder and periodically at least you have to have a look through that to see if any relevant mail has actually inadvertently found its way in there. I was looking at some this very morning that I had to sort of scan through and okay there was a couple out of the eight messages or so that have been classed as spam in the last day. There was a couple there that needed to be retrieved. Installing updates, so many of the updates that we get notified about for the operating system and for applications are critical security related things which we're advised not to ignore. And in many cases, the operating system will decide, okay, you're having it whether you've said yes or not, and we're going to reset your system and install it for you. And then the, so, some of the more maintenance-related things, if you're following good security practice, you ought to be periodically scanning your system for malware, even if you've got the real-time scanning enabled, a, a periodic scan is still useful of the full thing, doing backups, of course. And some of these will be daily, some will be weekly, some will be less frequent. So, from my perspective, then, some of the daily things that I do on uh, my devices, so anyone sort of observes me for more than 10 minutes, you'll see that smartphone come out at some point, and I'll be entering the pin in on that. I happen to have a nine-digit pin on the phone, so it takes me a few seconds to tap it in and, and get it right. And I tend to do it at least 15 times a day. I'm spending a few seconds doing that. Logging into the laptop, that's relatively quick, still a few seconds to get past that, particularly when I'm waking my laptop up from sleep. It, takes a few seconds just to allow me to type the password in the box. So I'm sat there waiting for security to let me do the thing that it wants. Dealing with my encrypted USB key, that takes a good 20 seconds. By the time you plug it in, it's detected and the thing comes up to let you enter the password. Logging into websites, well, I do quite a few of those a day. So, yeah, it's all little bits, but it adds up you know, as you do more of them over the time. Then there's the weekly events, so logging into e-banking, because I like to keep an eye on my money as an academic, you know, we don't have much of it, so you keep a, keep a good eye on whether it's still there. Um, Antivirus updates, now for me, I have to wait for this to happen every time I decide I'm going to load up Windows in a virtual machine on my Mac. I don't have it running all the time, so every time I do lo load it up, it almost inevitably wants to do some updates to the AV signatures, and so I don't want to do anything much more with it until I'm up to date with the protection. So, you know, a bit of waiting there. Spam checking, as I say, going through, seeing what's been misclassified, making sure I'm not missing something. And software updates, typically at least one of those a week, and that takes a, at least a couple of minutes. Very often, if it's wanting to reset my system, I have to sit there twiddling my thumbs, drinking coffee or whatever, not getting on with productive stuff. So, let's add some of that stuff up then. So the daily tasks then, let's say, eh, it's only a couple, you know, couple of minutes a day, let's say. Um, plus, uh, let's say I do that every day, every working day I do that in full and maybe do a third of it on the weekends because I still do you know, a fair bit of emailing and stuff. So you know, reduce it for the weekends a little bit. So that's about just over 22 minutes a week. Still tolerable there. Um, so that's... Uh, about 19 hours a year then, spent just doing those little bits. So that's a waking day of my year is ultimately lost doing these little security things. You know, just keeping things ticking over, just using the bits that are actually there in front of us all every day on the devices. So, you know, that's... You know, a day of my life has, has gone for security. And that doesn't count lecturing and doing all the things like actually enjoying the subject. That's just the things I have to do. And there's other bits. So that was just the routine day-to-day -day stuff. There's actually, if I perform the full system AV scan, that's going to take a little bit more time. Dealing with backup, making sure that's there, properly configured. Dealing with the security alerts that pop up and the, the ad hoc interactions that I wasn't expecting, that I wasn't planning. Things around recovering passwords on websites. I'm sure um, many of you have also got loads and loads of web-based accounts where you don't routinely remember all the passwords and you rely on password. I've forgotten the password and do the reset recovery business to get you back into the site if you, you come back to using it. So all of those things, again, it's time lost potentially to security-related tasks. So what are the implications are? I mean, I enjoy the subject, so I'll put up with it. But for, for other people, perhaps, this is, this is one of these bits might be the straw that breaks the camel's back here. Okay, so if users are then asked to do things in addition to all these little bits that they already feel they're having to do, then perhaps the chances of them really wanting to engage are quite limited. And so their, their tolerance for things that are difficult to understand, for things that make things complicated for them, 
um, that make the task more involved than perhaps they think it needs to be, things that slow their system down, things that just, okay, it's optional and it takes a lot of my time to do it, so perhaps I won't do it this time because I'm in a hurry. All those sorts of decisions can lead to security getting compromised somewhere along the line. And that's something that's quite relevant for those offering security and those implementing it within the technologies to think about because people haven't got limitless time and patience and so if you, you're presented with a security interface that you don't have to use and it's actually going to require a lot of your effort to to master it, to even understand what it's wanting of you. If you can get past it, many people will do that, and that then increases the actual exposure of them, their data, their organization, or whatever. So let's have a look at just another example of an interface. This is the nice, you know, very nicely laid out dashboard that you get in a, a typical Norton product, for example. And again, uh, probably difficult to read too much of it from a distance. But it's, again, talking about various aspects within this overall internet security suite that are there and at this point are all reporting themselves to be secure. So everything is fine, everything's secure, written in green, all very confidence building. But you've got virus protection, inbound firewalls, spyware definitions, Internet Explorer settings, virus and spyware scan, protection updates, spyware protection, Windows automatic updates, Windows account control. So some of the things, again, that the operating system was talking about. But, okay, when it all says secure and it's all written in green, the user's happy. What happens when it says something requires attention, something is outdated? Again, it's at that point that this becomes perhaps more troublesome because, well, what does it require? What does it mean for that bit now to say insecure, unprotected, out of date or whatever in red? How important is it for them to then get on with dealing with that? And if they don't know what the function of these various things is, so what, what's the inbound file? What's spyware definitions versus spyware protection in that top list? What, what's the distinction between them? What's one doing that the other's not, etc.? So it's quite a lot for the user to have to know in order to make informed use of this. So, so some potential consequences then. So users these days are very aware, I think, of the fact that there are threats out there. It's very difficult to, to go online and escape the fact that there are some problems that you're told you need to be aware about. So the potential for attackers, scammers, malware, etc., etc. But very often, when it gets down to any sort of granular level, the users aren't that aware of the difference between some of these threats, so the distinction between a worm and some spyware, and between phishing and more general identity theft. What, what, what bit is protecting against what? They know they need the protection somehow, they keep getting told this, but they're not quite sure in many cases what the different bits are doing and what bits are the most important. And so the consequence there is, okay, they've got the, the internet security suite running, and they're placing almost complete confidence in that's there, that's protecting me, I've, I've paid for it, or it came on my system, it said it's there for protection, and that's what I've got. And if they have to go beyond that, and that includes very often the point of just making a decision about you know, should I allow something or disallow something, at that point they're flying blind very often. So, I mean, efforts have been made to try and relieve this burden by certainly many things now, if we were to look sort of five to ten years ago, comparing the product then to the ones we get now in terms of the degree to which security is enabled by default and out of the box, things are much better these days. So you get in the operating system, like Windows, for example, since, what was it, XP Service Pack 2, you've had the firewall enabled by default. You've, you know, basically, security has been on rather than it needing to be a conscious user decision to enable it. Similarly, with wireless access points um, you know, back in the days when it provided that, that dubious security through WET, um, you know, at that point, you weren't even provided with that switched on out of the box. It had to be something you, you chose to have that was called encryption. Well, now you've got WPA and beyond that's enabled by default, well, at least in the UK. I guess it's similar. Here, when you take it out of the box, you've got security. You need to make a conscious decision to switch it off. So the defaults are better, and they're protecting the user. But again, what happens when you want to go beyond this, or when something happens that, okay, you didn't go looking for security, but it finds you? Let's, let's have a look at just an example of how things have not, uh, they've evolved in terms of better defaults, but they've also evolved in terms of the complexity of what the tool is actually able to ask you about or able to offer you in terms of, of options. So Internet Explorer, a fairly standard application for, I guess, many of the people in the audience, certainly for the end user community in general. Um, over a decade separated Internet Explorer 4 from the current version, i.e. 10, 
But the main security choices that you get are pretty much the same, and the level of help that you get is pretty much non-existent in many cases. But the underlying options, the, the actual configurable elements of it have become far more involved over that period. So now Internet Explorer 10, if you go in and have a look at the custom settings for internet security, has about 50 different options, and we'll have a bit of an illustration. So here's the screenshots of the, the two variants, 10 years apart, so to speak. Um, so IE4 looks fairly straightforward. You can just select your, your zone, so your different content zone. It's a bit more graphical on IE10. You've got little images to denote the internet, your local intranet, and trusted and untrusted sites. In IE4, then, you've got four levels of security that you can set, high, medium, low, or custom. IE10 changes it a little, makes it a bit graphically more interactive. You've got a slider that you can move up and down, and at least in the internet zone now, you don't have low security. You go from high to medium high to medium, and you can't get to low, and you can select custom security. So you know, from the user perspective, oh, it looks nice, you can move a slider, and you can select meaningful sounding levels. But Okay, let's, I mean, I'll read the description out for medium high security and, and see what we think. So it says, appropriate for most websites. That's all right, we, we can live with that, that sounds okay. Prompts before downloading potentially unsafe content. Okay, that also sounds good. You know, users might make a few assumptions there about, well, what is the potentially unsafe content? So their assumptions about what they're now protected against versus what it's actually doing could be a little askew. And unsigned ActiveX controls will not be downloaded. So that's going to be meaningful, I'm sure, to the majority of, uh, of end users. Um, and just out of interest, how many people in the room know what an ActiveX control is? Okay, and how many people in the room know what it means for it to be unsigned? Okay, so, uh, so about half the hands went up for knowing what ActiveX is, and about half of those hands went up for the unsigned. And this is a, a, a more security literate or IT literate audience than the general population. So, I mean, ActiveX control is active content, active executable content, Microsoft's component standard that can run within the browser. And for it to be unsigned means it's not digitally signed, which means the browser can't verify the origin. Now, if we don't know that, what's the user going to make of that in general, in terms of that, that is what denotes medium-high security? Because as you move that slider down, that's one of the things that disappears as part of the characteristic of the description. So to know that they're protected to medium versus medium-high is something around ActiveX, which they don't know what it is. Okay? If you go into the custom settings, and you've got an even greater box of delights to explore, um, if you just... In comparing the two interfaces, just look at the thickness of the scroll bar thing that you can move up and down. And you notice in IE10 that it's much smaller, so there's far more options, basically, that you can configure. Notice in IE4 there was a little context-sensitive help icon um, in the top corner, top right corner of the window. That's gone in IE10. It didn't actually tell you very much anyway. It used to tell you that these were security options, and you could select disable if you wanted to disable them or enable if you wanted to enable them. Those were the words I never understood, actually, enable and disable. All the other stuff, active scripting, binary and script behaviors, authentic code, software channel permissions, all the other things. I knew what they were since birth. Enable and disable, I have never understood the difference until I actually explained it to me. Um, now it gives you no help. You can quit out of it and go to the help system, and sometimes you'll find an answer. In most cases, you have to go to Microsoft's online knowledge base to get any sort of description about what these settings are. And of course, you know, from the user perspective, most users are going to stay well away. And if they change something, they'll come out from that, and their slider will have disappeared, and they'll have a thing that now tells them their security is set to custom. Now it doesn't even tell them how high the level of protection is. It will, in later versions of IE, since IE7, I think it will warn you if you've set something to an insecure setting, explicitly exposing your, your system. But otherwise, you get no indication beyond that of whether you've set it higher than the default, lower than the default, or whatever. 
So that's just the, you know, the browser security settings. There's a few more things. You get a variety of different privacy options that you can set as a user as well. So even more to understand there if, if the user, because you're told as a user that web potentially dangerous place to be, lots of threats to your security and to your privacy. So perhaps many users will be drawn to at least trying to have a look at this to see, well, what can I understand? How can I protect myself? And then quickly going away because they don't understand very much of how it's being presented. Then a few more bits, um, so from the, the, the safety menu in IE10, you've got all these different options, so you, you, you've got your in private browsing, your tracking protection, your ActiveX filtering, well we all know ActiveX now, um, web page privacy policy, you can turn off smart screen, what are all these things? These are all, I mean some of them are explained of course, and you know, we, we know through use what some of them are, but again it's that level of requirement to know what all this is in order to actually take any genuine confidence from the safety features, security features that are provided. So it's, again, it's that learning curve that it's putting in front of the user. So we've got elements of the technology. All the features are there, but users aren't required to use them. Okay? They are options in many cases, and they're not required to understand them. And they're not even required to know that they're present in all cases. They can find them sometimes, but sometimes when they encounter them, it will be a bit of a surprise. So in many cases, therefore, they wouldn't get used unless these were the things that were switched on by default. Okay? Um, and even if they're the defaults, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be straightforward. As I said, security, even if you don't go looking for it, it can come and find you. So uh, you get things like this, and again, these are okay, sort of routine, um, you know, depending on what operating system you're using. So on a Mac, for example, there, um, if you're trying to allow, install something that you've downloaded um, from the net, or you've got some update, that, it requires your explicit permission to run, so that you're, you're at less risk of malware coming along and doing something without authorization. Um, Windows users will be vaguely familiar with uh, user account control, which pops up every time you want to do anything. If you're using Vista, it's been toned down a little bit in uh, Windows 7 and onwards. But again, these are you know, things that just pop up, particularly user account control with its dimming of the screen and all the rest of it. Pops up just when you're trying to get on with something useful. Okay, here's a little interruption from security for you. And those are fairly straightforward. Those are just okay, type your password, click okay, just to explicitly acknowledge that you're allowing it to do something. But sometimes the decision is a bit more involved. So, uh, I say, in many cases you can accept the defaults and, and hope that that's doing the job. But I say, what about then if a decision is actually required? So, how about something like this from the browser? You've left everything else alone, and then this pops up. Now, you didn't ask for this. You, you, you've just visited a website, and it pops up, and it tells you this particular thing. And the, here, um, the name of the security certificate is invalid or doesn't match the name of the site. Right, so um, do you want to proceed? Yes, no? Who knows? I mean, hands up if you know what a certificate is. Again, I would expect a fair name. Again, not everybody. So this is, this is basically something that tells you that the site is trustworthy, and you... You can view the certificate here, which isn't going to be very meaningful to the average user. There's no explanation in the interface of what the certificate is. And so the yes, no, well, again, it's, it's a bit potluck. Um, in more modern versions of the browser, you get this interface instead, which uh, it, it, it's more visual, gives you more warning about if you're pro uh, proceeding to a site where the certificate isn't potentially trustworthy, you get the red browser bar there at the bottom as a result of going to a potentially untrusted site. Notably, if you've gone and fiddled with that slider business in the security settings and you've put it to high because you're quite concerned about security, so you want the maximum protection, set that slider to high and then get this warning, and that more information tab that I've dropped down there then won't work. Okay, you click more information as much as you like and it won't drop down and tell you anything more because the high setting has disabled scripts and so it can't run. Um, so yeah, it ju Just another example of security being ever so helpful and um, actually coming into conflict with itself in that context. And there's something like this can pop up. So it's a security warning, okay, it's announced itself, it's got a nice like on there. Um, so allowing active content such as script and ActiveX controls can be useful, but active content might also harm your computer. Are you sure you want to let the file run active content? How do you know? Where's the help then? 
There's nothing in there to explain more about what it's actually found. No, no routes to getting further information. Now, as a potentially more informed user, if you could see what this had popped up over the top of, so if you'd gone to a particular site and perhaps you had an expectation it had active content, you might then have the confidence to say yes, or if you really weren't expecting there to be active content, you'd say no. But in other cases, you know, again, average situation for the average user, this is a, a dirty Harry moment. Do you feel lucky? You know, yes or no? Make my day. And so, again, this is the sort of thing that won't be welcomed by many people. And, again, risks giving the whole issue of security and their dealings with it a bit of a bad name. Other scenarios, so all of that was sort of operating system level stuff. How about social networks where, again, you can share a lot of information with people and you, you get the, the warnings that, well, you know, don't, don't share too liberally and put some controls over it. Be careful what you share with people who aren't your friends. And then you look at what things like Facebook have done over time and the default sharing of your data has become far more and more permissive and far more open. So by default, your data, unless you tell it otherwise, gets shared with more people. So not just your friends, but also friends of friends and publicly visible. You have the controls to go in and change things, but you need to understand, you know, you need some sort of training in access control to actually understand what's the most appropriate setting to put to make sure that bit of my data doesn't get exposed to somebody that I don't want to see it. Okay, and the whole thing of friends and friends of friends and the different levels of permission you want to assign. Okay, so conceptually it's straightforward, but when you get down to the practice of trying to do it and to keep up with the, the changing of the defaults, it's again tricky. And even with all of that stuff that you can have running on your system, and I've got all of that sort of stuff that I've previously like, you can still get things. You can still get security threats that it will wave it through very happily and let you deal with it yourself. So here's an example. Just at, when, when did I receive this? So this was middle of November, just quite coincidentally when I was putting these slides together. Here comes a phishing message um, from, allegedly, from Cooperative Bank. Now, I don't believe it is from Cooperative Bank, um, partly because I don't have an account with Cooperative bank, so it was sort of fairly announcing itself to me as bogus to begin with, but I thought, well, okay, I'll be a bit foolhardy. Let's click on the link and see where it takes me, and let's have a look at what the website looks like. I've got my internet security running, so it's bound to warn me about it, and it didn't at all. Not on the Mac, not on Windows, and not on a mobile device either. So all of them proudly take you to the phishing site, even though all of them proudly have some sort of anti-phishing protection allegedly within the browsers. So all of them would quite happily take me to the site and allow me to provide all of this full name, place of birth, memorable name, all my personal details that it's asking for on this phishing page, because it's not the genuine page. It's asking for details that would allow somebody else then to pose as me and do a nice bit of identity and account theft, potentially, um, from me if I was a cooperative bank user. So, what's the most common safeguard we tend to encounter? What's the most common interaction we have with security? Well, other than perhaps things like passwords, one of the things that we find is this, the patching it. Yeah. Getting it right later on in the process. Retrospectively putting it right when we've been exposed one way or another for quite a long time. So let's have a look at some example there. So just using Microsoft as a for instance here. Just, just in this year, there have been 40 or more, well, more than 40 security-related updates, so things that you need to install to maintain your security or to update, introduce, whatever, security for the various Mac and Windows bits of uh, software that they offer. So some of these will be applications, some will be Windows itself. Um, so this, of course, this is a challenge not only to us as individuals, it also is an issue for organizations when you've got this software rolled out on various devices in the physical environment of the workplace, out in the mobile fleet, etc. And uh, so unpatched systems, from the point where a patch is available, particularly, they are then an increased risk. Because once a patch is out there, the exploits start to come more readily. The patch gets reverse engineered, and then the attackers will know, OK, this is, this is what the patch is doing at the software level. This is where we can now inject an exploit in an unpatched system and do, it, do something with it. And I say it's hard to manage if you're talking about mobile users um, or people not on a broadband connection. You think of the amount of data that this is getting you to download. And so somebody who's still on dial-up connections or you know, on a slow connection, they will think twice very often about, well, do I want to now allow this thing to spend 
hours potentially downloading new versions or a new, new update, etc. Or do I actually want to get on with what I was doing? And I say mobile users, if they're outside of the organization and coming back, they could be quite happily, ignorantly, blissfully unaware, bringing back unpatched systems into the workplace that might have contracted something unfortunate while they're out in the field. So again, relies on the organization having some sort of checking when they come back into the home network. What I'm showing, this is the, the, the technology adoption curve. So basically recognize the fact that there are early adopters in terms of technology, then if you like the early majority, so the bulk of the population um, will be either in an early or late batch. And then there are technology laggards, those who take a real long time to get the latest version of an operating system or the latest device or whatever. Now from the security perspective, it could be quite easily argued based on the, the previous slide and what we see with patching that it's far better to be a laggard there because if you adopt it late, a lot of the problems that have affected the early adopters are very likely to be solved for you. So you're using a far more secure platform by that point. But of course, you know, all the vendors, all the, the producers want you, they're extolling you to get the latest version because the latest version has got all these features, which in many cases that you, you might actually want. But if we actually want to take security seriously, sitting and waiting and being a bit dull and boring about it is, is actually likely to be a better route to being protected. And that's, that's actually quite unfortunate. Because, uh, as I said, what we really want to be able to do is take maximum advantage of the technology as soon as it's useful to us, not to have to have this cooling off period when we believe we can actually trust it. Oh, and there's also the situation when the technology pops up happily and says, security, why would you want to bother? Let me introduce a vulnerability for you. So here's a good example of the old password save feature that the browser offers you, um, which you know, I'm sure people have had the experience of inadvertently clicking yes on, on this, on a system which you then think, oh bugger, this is a public system, this is an internet cafe, this is not my system, and I've just done the, the reflex thing of clicking the, in this particular case, um, the default option, I've just let it go through, and then realize you've saved your password on a system that isn't yours, and now you need to go through the effort of removing that password from the, the password cache on the system if you've got permission to do it. Or indeed, you, know, you just say no, and you don't want to save it even on your own system because you know that actually providing the password each time is more secure. But this is sending the message to users that actually, okay, we know you don't like passwords, and we know you don't like that bit of security, so we'll get rid of it for you. And that's a great message around security. We know it's bad, so, so let's hide it and remove it from you. And of course, that's a scenario where password use is, again, one of the very common things that people have to deal with. So it's a scenario that people will recognize the burden. And so just from a bit of small survey stuff that we did um, a couple of months back, how many passwords do people typically have to deal with? And we can see that about a third of people have 16 or more passwords or at least accounts with passwords that they're, they're having to manage. And I guess that's not unusual again for people in the room. More and more devices, more and more online services particularly, if you think about websites, etc. You know, how many of those have you actually got passwords on? And if you follow the good practice that all of the books will tell you and all the guidance will tell you, you know, it's got to be at least however many characters plus whatever combinations you choose, fill in your own number there. Don't share it with people, don't write it down, use a different one for every system, change it regularly please. And all that. You're not going to do that unless you're obsessed with passwords for every system very effectively, I would suggest. So, also, how, how do the sites that are asking for these passwords encourage us to use them properly? How do they actually enable us to make good use of passwords there to protect our accounts? So, did something. Uh, just about a year ago or so, um, looking at some of the top websites, you know, names that you'll recognize, the Googles, the Amazons, those sort of people, and the password practices that they require and enforce and the guidance that they provide on their sites for users creating accounts. So basically what I had a look at was what restrictions do they apply? And you can see from the, the, the chart here, there's quite a lot of unapplied restrictions here. So just to, to explain the columns, we looked at, okay, what's the minimum or minimum length that they will accept? So in most cases, you can see a minimum length requirement of six characters, which isn't particularly great. Um, Wikipedia um, didn't insist on any sort of minimum, so you could have a one character password. Interestingly, a couple of years ago when I did this the first time, about three years ago when I did this the first time, Amazon 
Amazon would have allowed you to have a one-character password at that point as well, and to lodge your credit card and payment card details on the site, protected by a single character. It's quite nice. Um, most of the sites don't prevent you from using your surname as the password. Um, they, you know, they will typically be collecting, many of them will collect your name as well as your user ID that you want to use. So they know that they could find out what your, your name is and thereby prevent you from using your name or a variant of it as the password. Some of them will allow you, not the majority, but some will still allow you to reuse your user ID as the password. Many will allow you, um, or no, many will not allow you to, to use the word password, so most, most prevent that from being used, but there are a couple, as you can see, that allow it. Amazon still doesn't fare particularly well across the, across the road there, you see. Um, I also tested with a, a, just a choice of dictionary word. I can't remember what the word I used was now. Let's say it was apples or something. So I tried a dictionary word on every one of the sites, and uh, most of them were not doing anything to filter those out. Um, most of them don't check the composition of the password, so making sure that you're using a mixture of upper, lowercase numerics and all the rest. Um, this was a year ago, so some of them might have evolved since then. Um, many of them will advise you on it. So they have, you see many of them have a password meter. And so the password meter will get better if you're using a mixture of upper and lowercase and numerics, etc. But they won't enforce that you use that. So some will tell you, yeah, the, the password is weak, but away you go, you can still use it. Um, and many of them, so I'll create the accounts and then change the password, only a couple of them will prevent you from reusing old passwords that you've used in the past. So all of the good practice that, again, you know, I say we get told this um, in the textbooks and in an organizational context, all the things you should do, many of the websites don't embed that practice within the users. And this is the experience that, or the, the most common scenario, I guess, that many people will be using passwords. And it might be, for some users these days, their first encounter with password security. So they'll, they will take a benchmark of, well, what's good, acceptable practice from what these sites allow. Okay, if six-character password is good enough for Facebook and Twitter and whatever, maybe six-character password is sufficient for me everywhere else. So, I say, password enforcement was quite variable, so the most were six. Um, Google was the best of the bunch, with enforcing an eight-character minimum. Um, some sites, less usefully, enforced a maximum length of 16 characters for Windows Live and 32 for Yahoo. Okay, 32-character password is probably an acceptable maximum, um, otherwise you're going to take a week to type it in. Um, and I say many things that they could enforce, they didn't. They advised and they informed you about it, but they didn't force you to do it properly. Again, with many of these, the idea from the site's perspective, I'm sure, is make it as simple as possible for people to sign up and get an account so they can start providing their data to the site or making the purchases. We don't want to put too much of an obstacle in the way for people to get them signed up, so let's make the passwords as permissive as we can. Okay? But it's not enforcing, it's not building that culture of good practice. So back to our little survey and what we asked people recently. So we asked people, okay, what are your password practices? For your thinking about your most important account or your main password or, what, or whatever, what, what does it comply or not comply with? So, okay, the majority seem to have got the message of having a decent length of password, but you still see a, a, a tangible proportion that have short of eight characters. Um, most have got a mix of character types. Um, fewer have punctuation symbols, so they've gone alphanumeric, but they've not introduced other symbols that make a brute force attack harder. Um, almost a fifth there, having a dictionary word as their password, which is somewhat worrying. Um, most haven't changed the password, um, and some of them are still basing it on personal information. So you know, despite all of the, you know, the years and years of password being used and all this stuff being standard good practice guidance, many users today still don't put that into practice. Okay? So it's a difficult lesson to learn, apparently, but passwords are almost inescapable as a primary means of authentication, and many people just don't use them properly. So the upshot of all of that, I would say, is that, okay, we've got technology, and it's, in many cases it's good, and it's certainly important to have it, but it isn't going to save us. Okay? It's not going to be that complete safety net that many people would like to think it should be. Um, so we need a level of security literacy amongst the user audience. They, they need, whether they like it or not, they need to be aware not only of the threats, but also the things they can do about it. And then you just see something from November of this year, just, I thought that was an interesting stat to flag up. 
16 million people in the UK, so a tangible proportion of the population, are lacking basic online skills. doesn't mean they're not online, but they are, they are lacking some of the, the, the basic skills you would expect them to have. So needing to lump security literacy on top of that, unless you count that as a basic online skill, I, I would, but I'm sure this particular survey didn't, um, it's another big ask. And it's, again, a thing that we don't seem to be learning. So if I, if I look at a couple of um, surveys here, we've got the, what was the Department of Trade and Industries Information Security Breaches Survey from back in 2000, just to show this is a, a long-term issue. 16% of the respondents, this was a survey of 1,000 UK businesses, 16% claim that the lack of training of their staff, which presumably they had some control over, um, was the reason for their most significant security incident. Ernst & Young, Global Information Security Survey, pretty similar time period, 66% citing employee awareness as the main barrier to getting effective security. That was the top listed barrier, ahead of cost, ahead of the inconvenience of it, employee awareness. Going forward to a more recent version of the Information Security Breaches Survey, now under the ban of PricewaterhouseCoopers, the last paragraph of the exact summary, given the rising level of breaches seen in the survey, it's more critical than ever that organisations raise the security awareness amongst their staff. So are they doing it? Well, in many cases, not very significantly, unfortunately. Um, looking at uh, the CSI survey, so I think it's still the most recent one from the Computer Security Institute, this is the US survey, what did, they, what did they do, or what did they feel they needed to do after an incident had occurred? So what was the necessary response? You can see there in over 40% of cases, providing additional training to users in response to an incident was something they felt they needed to do. The majority of the stuff higher than that you can see is patching of something or other, um, so maybe an administrative lesson there. But basically, unaware users seem to be a significant issue. They are causing problems. So organisations surely ought to be doing a bit more about it. But you look at uh, you know, the, the, the evidence and perhaps still they're not. So they don't know enough, it's proven to cause problems, let's do something. So what are we doing? So same CSI survey, what's the percentage of the um, security budget that's actually spent on uh, training? Okay. So in a third of cases, less than 1% of the security budget, so whether the security budget is big or small, less than a percent of it goes on training. Um, and very few, or relatively few, spending more than 10% of their budget on it. Now, okay, you might say, there, maybe for them, that is the appropriate proportion to spend, and they, they consider that enough. Later question from the same survey, they asked the, the respondents, who were basically typically the IT and information management people within the organisation, to think about five different areas of security spend and whether enough was being spent or too much or sufficient level was being spent. You can see the five areas there. Security training was the only one in which, the, well, just slightly, the majority view was that too little was being spent on it. Okay, very few people you can see there saying that too much is being spent on training, whereas if you were to look at the results for security technology, uh, relatively few people thinking that too little was spent on that, and a fair proportion would think that too much was spent. Security training, underinvested and causing issues. But still, uh, you look at the late, I don't think I've got it in this slide set, but look at the latest Ernst & Young survey, and again, it will be flagging up issues around lack of awareness causing some of the most significant issues, but then you look at the spending priorities, and security training and awareness is well down the list. Topping the list, technology again. Ah, in fact, here it is. Um, so, so same, same issue. First, out of 16 threats was... Uh, careless or unaware employees, that's basically what I was just saying. And I say, security awareness, 17th out of 20 things that they were going to be prioritising. And 56% plan to spend the same on security awareness, so no further investment, even though unaware employees is the top risk exposure area. But 55% are going to spend more on technology. So, what I would suggest is that things you know, need to change. There needs to be some fundamental, if you like, 
back to basics grassroots level of getting security more into the mindset of the next generation of users. So I would say it needs to be part of schooling and increasingly you do get to see elements being put in there, particularly around e-safety and some of the, the online threats facing the younger generation, but still the things around the, the protective technologies and the, the security rather than the e-safety stuff I think could get more emphasis. It needs to be more of a priority for government in the sense of more investment in there for some of these awareness raising campaigns. Um, Perhaps as a society, it needs to be an expectation that we have. I mean, a couple of years back, there was a, a quote from Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook talking about privacy no longer being a social norm because people were quite happy to share their data openly on Facebook. Of course, he would say that. Um, but perhaps we should, perhaps a social norm we should be expecting is that secure, people will protect their systems, take things seriously there because their vulnerable system could actually be an effect upon us. Okay, their vulnerable system infected by malware, sending out phishing messages, sending out spam to the rest of the online community is not helpful. And so perhaps there should be an expectation, even as individuals, we're doing something to protect it. Perhaps it should be a duty of care for employers. So not only to protect their system, but to protect their staff from the threats that they may face in terms of phishing and things coming through the organization's email. If you invest some effort in training staff, for the benefit of the organisation, it will also benefit them as, as individuals themselves, give them access to free antivirus that they can use at home, for example, because that then, when they're inevitably taking some aspects of data and work home with them, it's going to be protected in that context. It, it helps to embed that lesson. And it needs to be properly presented by vendors in terms of the interfaces and the usability. So, so I've got on the on the right hand side there, what I've termed the security hurdles that you might face as an individual. And the first one is perception. You've actually got to realise there's a security threat out there that's relevant. Next thing is you've got to prioritise it. You've got to realise it is important and perhaps it has a greater importance for you to, or for that to be dealt with than some other things that you might otherwise do. You've got to recognise there's a level of responsibility on you as an individual to be doing it. It's not your ISP's issue, it's not your employer's issue, it's not the system administrator's issue, it's your issue to be doing something as well. And then potentially there's challenges around having the confidence to deal with it as a user, having the actual skills and IT capability to deal with it. And Perhaps the ultimate hurdle then is the usability. So you might have somebody who's fully bought into the existence of the threat, that it's important for them, they've got to do something, they feel you know, confident that they'd like to try and do something about it, and then the tool that they're presented with makes it impossible for them to do it properly because they don't understand it. it's not usable enough. There are various public awareness raising campaigns that you can find. So I've got an example from the US, the Stop, Think, Connect campaign that they run around security awareness from Stay Safe Online. Recently in the UK we had, uh, well this year it was branded Click and Tell from Get Safe Online, encouraging people to share their security experiences with friends and family so that they would raise awareness by word of mouth and things. And you've got various, I've uh, picked on some European and US ones, various campaigns, so National Cyber Security Awareness Month and a similar thing within Europe. We have Safer Internet Day every February, um, we have Data Protection Day. So various things that are out there to potentially raise the prominence and raise it on the agenda, but still you find many people completely unaware on a day-to-day -day basis that they might be sitting within Get Safe Online Week or European Cyber Security Awareness Month. If things aren't being done to actually promote it and reach the audience in that context, the message could still pass them by. So, after all that, some conclusions. So it's fair to say that both the technology and the threats continue to evolve, of course they always will do. Um, if we compare again over time the range of devices that we use now, the range of services, they vastly increased for many people and we're now facing the security threats in all those contexts. Users themselves are increasingly the targets of the threats, the, the, the potential exploitable source of data for phishing messages, things of that nature. Their systems are the things that malware wants to go after because their system is an exploitable asset. We're finding things like malware are popping up in new contexts that we've had, them for, had it for years on desktop and traditional laptop devices on the you know, Windows operating system, for example. You know, we've learned a lesson there somewhere along the lines that we need protection. 
But now we've got mobile devices, we've got smartphones, we've got tablets, that, you know, they've got the potential to host the malware as well, Android in particular. Um, there's nowhere near the number of strains of malware for Android, but about 90% of the mobile device malware is on the Android platform, and very, a relatively small proportion of Android users are aware that that threat exists, and a, a smaller proportion of that have antivirus running or internet security running on their Android device. And they really ought to, because it's an increasing threat that's proving to be there. So I say all of this demands more IT literacy and more security literacy from the users who are being not only sold the technology, actively having the technology promoted to them. Um, so, but their knowledge and their, their practices around security just haven't kept pace with the advancement of the tools and the technologies themselves. So I say usability now is it's, it's still not really got any better in many of the tools to actually enable you to really use it. The only thing that's got tangibly better, I would say, is the, the level of default protection. And again, you can face problems when you try to go beyond it or something happens outside of that context. So technology is failing to strike the right balance in many cases. Sometimes you, f you find far too much security is too much in your face. Other times you don't find security options you would expect to be there. So talking about mobile devices, how about the iOS community? Well, on there, there's relatively little that you can visibly see that's, that's providing you with protection. There are allegedly some elements of, for example, um, protect you against fraudulent websites, um, anti-phishing protection basically built into the device and it updates itself periodically, but it's not a, a potentially a visible enough protection to, to let the user know they're safeguarded. And on iOS, you can't buy uh, internet security software because it's not something that Apple has permitted to be sold on the App Store. So particularly for users who've jailbroken their devices, they are very much exposed and there is although it's a relatively small amount compared to Android, there is malware for iOS if you're on a jailbroken device. There isn't a single solution, unfortunately. I didn't come with a solution ready-made to hand out at the end of the talk, so sorry about that. We, we need the technologies, we need the awareness, we need it all to work in harmony. And I mean, it's a, it's a fairly obvious message, but it's one that still, you know, for years of this recognition being there, it still doesn't seem to be being acted upon properly. Okay, but there's more criticality, more importance that this comes along adequately to safeguard the user community. If you're interested in a little bit more stuff from us, I've had some flyers outside for this as well. We've got a variety of security podcasts on our iTunes U site. They're all freely available. Um, some bits are bits of presentations. Some bits are interviews around particular topics. So there's a URL there. There might still be flyers outside, so feel free to take a look. And otherwise, feel free to email me, follow me on Twitter, look at our research centre web pages, see the papers and other bits that we're, we're doing there in Plymouth. Thank you.